It's like the, I found a spot in the floor that whenever we play that low G, the first violins, their chairs would actually bounce at the other side of the stage. I was like, okay, come on, nothing else does this. Joe McNally is one of the most fascinating, experimental, multi-dimensional bass players I've run into in recent years. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contra Bass Conversations, and I had the pleasure of getting to hang out with Joe McNally in 2017 at Andres Martin's wonderful Double Bass Festival in Tijuana. Andres is the bassist for the Baja California Symphony Orchestra, and Joe actually held this position before Andres. Joe has a fascinating background. He grew up in Southern California, steeped in this exciting musical environment. Dean Farrell was one of his good friends growing up. I've, I think I've featured Dean's music on the podcast, never chatted with Dean for the podcast. That definitely needs to happen at some point soon. But he went through and he studied with Ed Barker, uh, Miroslav Vitas, uh, so many amazing players at the New England Conservatory. And then headed back to Southern California, studied with Bert Turetsky at UC San Diego with so many other players that were dedicated to pushing the boundaries of what the double bass was doing. Joe also, and this is super interesting, we get into this in detail in this interview, he is the founder of the Hutchins Consort. Okay, and these Hutchins instruments, we talk about their background, but they are eight scaled violin instruments so going from very small to very large that were built by Dr. Carlene Hutchins. And these are acoustically uh, researched instruments using a process called free plate tuning. Again, I will let Joe describe this in more detail. I had the chance when I was visiting with Mark Dresser in 2017, I stopped by his bass studio and interviewed him. Mark let me play on one of these Hutchins basses. And wow, what a sound. This thing is just out of control. And Mark actually recorded one of his solo albums on this bass. So this is a super fun, freewheeling conversation with an incredibly creative artist and innovator in so many different areas of the music world. I really hope you enjoy this conversation. And we've got some great sponsors for today's episode. Diderio Strings, Robertson & Sons, Upton Bass, and A440 Violin Shop. More on them later. And we've got a couple musical examples here. We're going to be featuring Frederick Charlton's arrangement of Summertime, performed by the Hutchins Consort. And I've actually featured Frederick's music on the podcast in the past. And an original piece by Joe. And he's written so many pieces. Fascinating compositional style. And this was performed live at the Latin American Double Bass Festival in Tijuana. All right, let's dig into our conversation with Joe McNally. Just tell me or tell folks, I guess, about the Hutchins concert and just how that, how these instruments came to came into your life. Uh, how they came into my life, that's an interesting story. I transferred from New England Conservatory to UC San Diego in the uh, early mid-'80s. And um, Bert Turetsky was my teacher at UC San Diego, and he was trying to get a group started with the Hutchins instruments back mm -hmm. then. So he was trying to get the university to buy the set of instruments. In his office, he had the Hutchins Contra and the Hutchins Small Bass, and that's the one that Diana now owns. Okay. Um, and so he was trying to acquire those, but he didn't really want the giant Contra in his office, so he loaned it to me, and I was just floored by the sound of that thing. I took it to a um, rehearsal uh, with the La Jolla Symphony, and we were playing Brahms 1, and it's like the, I found a spot in the floor that whenever we play that low G, the first violins, their chairs would actually <laughs> bounce at the other side of the stage. I was like, okay, come on, nothing else does this. I tried to figure out why they behaved that way, so I picked up her physics books out no. of the library. And I'm not exactly a great scientist, but I was able to read through most of it. And I decided I really needed to have an instrument like that. And fast forward a few years of living in Hawaii and playing in all the desert orchestras in LA and all that. And um, I got back to this process of trying to make an instrument that was like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I got stuck on a couple of the calculations. So I found out Carlene was still alive. I called her at home. And she was very cordial, and you know, through the process of talking to her a few times, she told me, you know, there's still a set of instruments here, a complete octet, if you'd be interested in playing with them. 
So the next day I was at a recording session and I asked the concert master in that session and the principal cellist if they wanted to form a group and you know try these things out and they said yes and then I was actually working down here uh, with Orquesta de Baja um, and uh, the concert master here and the principal cellist said yeah we wanted to we'd like to try those out too so within two months we had a group together and so they just kind of fell into my lap more serendipitously than than anything else and then I formed a nonprofit to be able to buy the instruments and get people paid for their efforts so what, and if people haven't seen these before, what are they, like, can you just describe, like, what these instruments are, like, the different sizes? It's a set of eight, yes, so correct? It's, yeah. it's a set of eight violins, and each violin covers a half octave of range. So you have a regular violin, you have a soprano violin, it's tuned C, G, D, A, and then you have a treble violin above that, an octave above a normal violin, that's uh, G, D, A, E. The instrument that takes the place of the viola is an alto violin, so it's tuned the same as a viola, but it's 20 inches long and is big enough that almost everybody has to play it cello style. Uh, then there's a tenor violin that fills in what I like to say is that much needed gap between the viola and the, the cello. Stole that from Spinal Tap. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, that, that gap is a terrible gap that we have in the string orchestra, yeah. and you don't even realize it until you hear the tenor in that place. Uh, and that's GDAE. The baritone violin takes the place of the cello, and then that so that's tuned C G D A. It's a little longer and much thinner than a normal cello. And then the bass violin, which is what I play most of the time now, is usually tuned in fourths, um, A D G C, um, but is actually designed to be tuned in fifths, G D A E. And Parastro just sent me a set of strings, so I've been experimenting with tuning the way Carlene intended it. Uh, and then the contra, which is the gigantic monster of mother of all basses, um, that thing is tuned like a regular contra bass, except I usually open the uh, E string down to D, okay. um, just because we find we need that note a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and is that the same uh, octave range as the, the bass? Yeah. It is, okay. But okay. with considerably more tone. Um, yeah, it really throws the sound in a way I've never heard a conventional double bass do it. And it has to do with the physics of the instruments are just, they're different. The tops and the backs are tuned to the length of the plate. And each instrument is matched this way to each other as well. So you have a homogenous set of instruments instead of the contrasting timbres right. of a traditional string group. Right. Okay. Because the so so it's the the proportions of the violin expanded throughout these different sizes. Is that or well, slightly different? But they're they're slightly different. They had to make okay. a certain accommodations for um, the possibility of being able to play them. Mm -hmm. So they're actually designed along a logarithmic curve. Not if you did it in a straight line, you'd have the viom. Uh, you know, contrabass 12 right. feet tall. Right, right. But if you do it along a logarithmic curve, then you can get everything within the range of human playability. playability. Yeah. Um, so that's, uh, they went, went as small as they could on the contrabass to make it still sound like a violin. Mm -hmm. And with the treble, they made it as big as they could to make, you know, to make that as playable because it would have been super teeny there were just problems of how do you get strings yeah. that are going to play a high E an octave above the violin E right. to that instrument. What, uh, when were these, when did she come up with the, the concept for these? When were these first made? Well, Henry Brandt came to her in 1957, the oh, okay. Pulitzer Prize winning yeah. composer, and he asked her to fix the strings. He had noticed when he was about 12 years old, his father played on a Strat, uh, had a string quartet, and um, he said he noticed that the instruments didn't match each other, the violin, the viola, and the cello. And he'd always wondered what was wrong. Um, so he went from luthier to luthier. And everybody either said, you know, there's nothing wrong with the strings. They, they were perfect and always have been perfect. And, and, or you're crazy and it can't, or it can't be done. <laughs> and Carlene Hutchins was the first person he approached who said, yes, that's act you're right. That's actually a problem. And yes, it can be solved through modern science. So um, even though she was a great scientist, um, she'd also studied with Sacconi. Mm -hmm. So she, you know, she knew her stuff on both ends of the equation there. The first, it took her until 1965 to complete the first set. But there were a lot of other scientists who also worked on the physics problems mm -hmm. to make the instruments work. Okay, interesting. Is, uh, so what, 
what sort of repertoire do you explore with this group? We do everything from medieval music to uh, stuff that was written tomorrow. Nice. Um, <laughs> and with the group I've got now, I've got a really great group of improvisers. Mm -hmm. So we've We've essentially got two ensembles. Um, we've got a group here in um, on the West Coast, and we tend to play kind of war horses and things that involve improvisation, jazz pieces, uh, uh, folk music, mm -hmm. all kinds of you know real shotgun blast yeah. of, of styles. There's a group that Chris Otto, who used to play in. Uh, the Hutchins Consort, uh, he started in New York called Hutchins East that I also play with. And they do a concert about every two years. They are almost entirely focused on new music. Mm. So they get composers to write pieces for it. And so we have quite a few contemporary composers who've written for the instruments as well. Oh, wow. Yeah. But totally different vibe. Yeah, different, sure. you know, and, and then like he has a couple of players from the Jack Quartet that he plays with that play with that group. And, you know, so they're both great groups, but very different focuses. This episode is brought to you by Robertson and Sons Violins. For more than 40 years, over four decades, Robertson and Sons has specialized in providing the highest quality string instruments and bows to collectors, professional musicians, music educators, and students of all ages. Their modern facility, which is totally beautiful, by the way, if you're ever able to make it out to Albuquerque, New Mexico, I highly recommend it. They have a recital hall that they use not only for performances, but it's available to their clients. So if you want to try out a fine pedigree base or even a student base or anything in between, you can go in that recital hall. I've had the chance to do that. Totally amazing. I'm like a kid in the candy store when I'm down there at Robertson's. Check them out online at robertsonsviolins.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. The A440 Violin Shop. It's located just down the street from Wrigley Field in beautiful Chicago on the north side, just off the Brown Line. I have been going there my entire adult life, and they have been fantastic, both for repairs. I've had cracks repaired. I've had seams glued. I've had all sorts of students go to A440 to get instruments, to get bows. They're available with a smile, do wonderful work, and definitely check them out if you are in the Midwest. A440violinshop.com, and thanks for sponsoring the podcast. I got I got to ask it to it's totally you know like being you were at New England Conservatory mm -hmm. and then made the switch out to UC San Diego which I think of as a very different vibe and place in most ways yeah, yeah. <laughs> what what prompted what prompted that move for you a couple things uh, first of all was that UC San Diego at that co time cost one tenth yeah there's that <laughs> one tenth of what uh, New England Conservatory cost yeah. Um, so I was able to pay for my own way through college, mm -hmm. um, thanks to doing that. And um, I don't want to say anything that sounds disparaging because I loved studying with Ed Barker. I, think, I thought he was a wonderful teacher, but I felt like in some ways I was missing something that, that I got at UC San Diego. And um, then spending time with Bert Tretzky there? Yeah, so I studied with yeah. Bert, and, and Mark was uh, one of the students back then. It was quite a big bass class back then. Um, Blade Alibal uh, mm -hmm. was there, and Luis Gomez was there for a while. And it was really quite a 
murderer's row of <laughs> bass players. <laughs> so, so I interviewed yeah. Bert, which was a lot of fun. You yeah. know, what a what a what a major figure in the world of bass. Like, what, yeah. what was and I've been in master classes with him and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. But what was he like as a as a teacher? He was very avuncular, um, and um, no, really very personable, deeply knowledgeable about style, and um, um, really trying to develop the individual artist, mm -hmm. not try to make any kind of clones uh, of himself. And that's one of the things I think he was most successful at as a teacher. You look at his students and no two of them play alike. Yeah. And um, so I thought he was a really excellent teacher for a teacher of artists. Um, and you know, generally good people. Yeah. yeah. And so Mark was your classmate as well. Yeah, of course. Mark is 12, 11 or 12 years older than I am, but I've known Mark also since I was in junior high school. I met him at Burt's, I think on my first bass lesson. If I remember this correctly, I got there and Mark was just finishing up. And can imagine being 12 years old and hearing Mark play. It was like, oh my God, <laughs> <laughs> I'll never be able to play that good. <laughs> and, uh, and then I heard Bob Magnuson like the following week, you know, it was like, these are who Bert, Bert students were at the, <laughs> at the time. I was feeling very, very small at right, that moment. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they were great. Uh, they, they always treated me great. Have you, and I think, I think of, you know, I think of Mark and I think of Bert, I think of like, just like exploring contemporary music and pushing the bounds of contemporary music and like mm -hmm. what, what role has, Contemporary music played in your life. Have you done a lot of solo bass works or different? You know, what, what's that been like for well, you? Early in my career, I did a lot of um, squeaky bonk stuff. Okay, a lot of, sure. You know, yeah, and, yeah. Um, and I love contemporary music, so I play it as much as I can. The problem for me programming it with the consort is that I have a very conservative, conservative audience base mm -hmm. to deal with, so I don't get to. Um, program as much new music as I would like. Um, periodically I will do a new music piece uh, if I'm doing a solo mm -hmm. or I'll squeeze it into a um, concert somehow. Um, but in the last 20 years, um, even though I've played a fair amount of contemporary music, I can't say that it's really been the driving thing for me. Mm -hmm. I'm, all, I'm looking for new modes of expression and new ways of reaching an audience. But I don't really let the idea of whether it's contemporary or not enter into the equation. Yeah. You know. What What are you outside of the the you know, Hutchins Consort and the you know the programs that you do for that? Like, well, how else do you keep yourself busy professionally? I have currently four student orchestras that I direct. Um, I started off eight years ago with seven students, and now I've got 105 in that program, um, including a bunch who play the Hutchins instruments. Um, and then I've got the private studio, um, so I've got a few students there as well. Um, I have 80 more services this year just playing The Grinch Who Stole Christmas at the Old Globe <laughs> Theater. Well, <there's> that. <laughs> yeah, it's an insane amount of work, so I go on a special diet and pop a lot of ibuprofen yeah, to get sure. through it. It's, ter it's terrible music. <laughs> Don't hear me, Old Globe. It's terrible, terrible music, but it, it's hard on the body and bad music, too. <laughs> But yeah, so I play I play shows and I stopped playing orchestra stuff really about 2006, mm -hmm. and really concentrated more on playing chamber music. Mm -hmm. And and I, oh, I, I like I'll dress up in later hosen and play in a new pop band, and I play a lot of Hawaiian music and things like that. So <laughs> yeah. So a hundred plus student, and, and this is condu conducting. This is conducting. That's great. How how did you? And I love conduct. I was a high school orchestra director for. Oh, so bunch you of years. know what this is like. I know. <laughs> probably we have a lot yeah. of stories we could share. Yeah. Like, how did you? How did? When did you start doing that? Well, um, a friend of mine who's a violinist um, had uh, started that program. They had started this new school, and she got elected to be president of the union. Mm -hmm. and, San Diego and so she called me up and said I can't do both jobs and I think you'd be really good for this why don't you go check it out and see if you want the, want the gig so I went over there and I I liked working with the little squirts yeah so, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny because you know my most of my teaching had been uh, professionals who come back to study with me mm -hmm. or you know or yeah or young professionals um, so I, I hadn't really been teaching a lot of beginner beginners mm-hmm 
um, at, at that point, and then to be teaching them on different instruments. Yeah, I thought, oh, there's a good chance for me to play more cello too. So yeah, give me an excuse to buy a cello. Oh, nice. Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. What? Uh, how did you meet? How did you meet Andres Martin? Andres replaced me here at Orquesta de Baja. Okay, so you were was, here before. I was okay. here before Andres, so I was on uh, all the recordings that they did in the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, Orquesta de Baja had a lot of financial problems, um, and a lot of the orchestra left. And I don't know how they managed to score Andres, but what a coup mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. Orquesta de Baja to get him. He's yeah. so great. Yeah. We became like, Thick as thieves, almost immediately yeah. after he moved here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, how and like living in San Diego for 20, 20 years. Well, when were you playing in this orchestra? Then was that before? That was after I'd lived in Hawaii. So okay, I moved from Hawaii in ninety five, um, and I started working at Orquesta de Baja almost immediately. That's another Dean Farrell story. Actually, I ended up in Orquesta de Baja because of Dean. Uh, how, how, how that happened? He was he was playing down here, and um, the uh, they were doing a, a a contemporary piece, and it was out of his um, wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. So he suggested that they have me come and do it, and um, then I had to shed really hard, so I didn't, you know. <laughs> so I lived up to Dean's expectation. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by D'Addario Strings. Check out their Kaplan Strings, which have versatility and control throughout the entire dynamic spectrum. Rich tonal color palette, superb bow response, and beautiful balance. I've been using them myself on my bass for the last year or so and totally love them. They sound great pizzicato. They sound great arco. Folks like David Allen Moore of the Los Angeles Philharmonic use them. Brandino of Black Eyed Peas, he uses them. What fantastic strings. Thank you for sponsoring the podcast, D'Addario. This episode is brought to you by the good folks at Upton Bass String Instrument Company. Eric and Gary and the whole Upton team, I can't say enough good things about them. And they have been on board with the various endeavors I've done online from the start. They were one of the early sponsors of the blog back in 2006 and 2007. And it has been so fun to follow along with their journey and see them develop these new models of basses like the Car Bass, the Bostonian, the Bohemian and to connect with all these amazing players. I've had the privilege of speaking with so many people that play Upton Basses from Eric Rivas of Branford Marcellus's band and Lucia Torino of The Devil Makes Three, all the way over to Anthony Monzo of the New Century Chamber Orchestra and Kevin Smith, Willie Nelson's bass player. I've had many students purchase Upton basses over the years. I've had a lot of colleagues play Upton basses. I see them on gigs all the time. They play great and Upton stands behind their work. Can't recommend them highly enough. Check them out online at UptonBass.com. Did you guys have a hall when you? I thought the didn't they have a hall built recently or what? Like where did you guys play when you were in Orquesta de Baja? Yeah, uh, at Secut, which okay. is a big hall. Okay, uh, it's um, it's still there. Oh, it is. Okay, okay. Yeah. I mean, my first time down here, so I haven't. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, you pass it right as you, if, if you go through the Zona Rio, mm -hmm. it's on the right hand side, it's got a big um, uh, planetarium dome. Okay. That's right there. Okay. Wow. Must have been a fascinating experience playing down here. Yeah, it <laughs> really was. Years. Well, and you know, that was back when there was drug cartel stuff going on too, so it was, it was always an adventure, you yeah. know. Yeah. But, but, but mostly a really positive one. Everybody was really nice excellent players you know the original orchestra down here was an orchestra that was brought from moscow really yeah when or ernesto if i've got this correctly or when ernesto Z, uh, zidio was um, education secretary before he became president mm -hmm. and he had identified this russian orchestra with a mexican conductor and wanted to install a, an orchestra to get a program going here in uh, Baja California because there wasn't a resident orchestra. So he brought that chamber orchestra and mass. So it was all Russian orchestra at first. And then little by little, we Americans infiltrated. Yeah, yeah. And uh, now it's a much more multicultural um, orchestra than it was wow. back when um, I first started playing with it. But back then, the rehearsals were held in a combination of Spanish and Russian. Okay. And since I speak no Russian, <laughs> I was just trying to pick up what little I could uh, along the way. <laughs> yeah. it, I, I haven't played one of the Hutchins instruments, but it's, I'm sure I will at some point here soon. But like, what do people, if you get people playing them that haven't played them before, what are some of the things that they find surprising about them? The they, response. Really? Um, it's so much faster than a normal contrabass. And the, um, just the way it throws the sound. Um, a friend of mine bought a really great old Italian bass, the Montagnana that was in the, uh, the cover of the 1911 Strad, mm -hmm. I think that was here. And when he bought that instrument, he brought it to my house and we did a uh, blind taste test between the two instruments. And as amazing as that instrument is, and that's a fantastic bass, the Hutchins Contra flattened it at 20 uh, paces. Really? Yeah. Wow. You know, and I, I would never have thought, you know, contemporary instrument would flatten a, a particularly an instrument of that repute. Right. But it really did. And I, I'm wishing I could live another 200 years to hear what they'll sound like when they're at their peak. Yeah. Since, you know, 20 years, the one I play on is just about broken in now. Mm -hmm. You know, and in 180 years, it's going to sound truly amazing. But... I can't. Maybe, maybe my robot head, you know. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, we'll be like Futurama. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nixon in the, in yeah. the bubble. Yeah, as long as I don't have to be with Nixon. I'm okay. <laughs> what, uh, what are you going to play tonight? Uh, mostly my own arrangements. I'm doing two of Dean's, actually. Uh -huh. I'm doing um, his uh, transcription of the Gymnopathy number one mm -hmm. and um, an arrangement that he did of El Cant des Ocelles, which... I modified both of them a little bit. Um, I'm doing a movement from a cello suite that I wrote. I know every ba bass player plays cello suite music. This is actually from a cello suite I wrote for a cellist. And I thought, you know, I might as well turn this into a bass piece now. So I'm doing that, and then I'm doing an arrangement of an old Whalers song. Not Bob Marley and the Whalers, yeah. but the people who harpooned <laughs> animals. The other Whalers. Yeah, the yeah. other Whalers. <laughs> and then if there's sufficient time, I have a little um, medley of protest songs I'm going to do. Okay. Okay, wow, yeah. that's great. Yeah. I, I got to ask because we're talking about Dean Farrell. Have you got any Dean Farrell, fun Dean Farrell stories that are also safe for me to? <laughs> well, here's here's a, a good one. Um, uh, you, you know, Dean does that piece about the rowboats. Yeah. Okay. Dean and I used to, um, uh, for lack of a better word, borrow rowboats uh, frequently from the um, the yacht club right next to the Coast Guard in Newport Beach and we would usually get a bottle of wine or two and row out to see the music that he wrote about that piece was not about an experience he had with me but the last time we did this together that was he and I went out on a very stormy night and Dean passed out in the, you know, we got we got out to sea, and he passed out in the bottom of the boat, and the swells were really big, and driving us out to sea further and further. So I rode for several hours while he was completely insensate, and finally I brought the boat in just above Laguna Beach, 
so several miles south. Um, and Dean has no memory. <laughs> 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 that not only that we, that we went out in a super huge storm, <laughs> but that we uh, we came back in one piece too. We were dripping wet. But <laughs> so yeah, I mean, we had a lot of interesting experiences, most of which probably shouldn't be uh, said. That's why I was, was wondering. I was like, I like <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, he was mostly a really good influence on me, yeah. and and remains a good influence on me. Um, and it, we are really good um, uh, co-conspirators, collaborators. You know, when it comes to doing uh, recitals, I really prefer to do like a duet recital with him because it's fun to bounce ideas off of each other, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we have the same kind of I think wicked sense of humor. Yeah, that way. Yeah. yeah. And thanks for chatting. That's oh, my really, pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> Joe, thank you so much. So great to chat with you. And folks, you can learn more at HutchinsConsort.org. We have links to that in the show notes. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you're having a great 2018 or whenever you're listening to this episode. I'm having such a wonderful time chatting with artists like Joe, and I love doing these conversations live. This was live. So many of my recent conversations have been live. And as I travel around the United States and other countries, I'm trying to bring my mics with me and record whenever I get a chance. And I would love to have you join in this journey with us here. If you have not subscribed to the podcast, you can do so. There are many ways. However you listen to podcasts, you can find us there. If you're new to podcasts, go to ContraBaseConversations.com slash subscribe, and all the options are there. You can use Apple Podcasts. You can use Stitcher. We have our own custom ContraBase Conversations app that you can get for iOS, Android, and Kindle. And you can sign up for our email newsletter, and you'll hear about every new episode that comes out through that as well. I am so thrilled to have you on this journey with me. If you ever want to reach out for a guest idea or a topic suggestion, we're brimming with ideas here. I compile all the ideas that people send along, and I have a lot of them that people have sent along, and I use that information to shape the show going ahead. So anything you have in mind that you think would be cool to hear on the show, or if you just want to reach out and say hi, you can email me at feedback at contrabaseconversations.com. I respond to each and every email, and I love to hear from people who listen to the show. It totally makes my day. I open up my email, and that's not necessarily a task that I love, opening up email, but I do, and I see messages from people that listen to the show, and it just warms my heart and fills me with such gratitude that people are out there listening and following along with this journey of mine and of ours through the double bass world. Thanks again. That's going to do it for today's episode, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. Bye.